And if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of John, John chapter 10, I hope that is your prayer and your decision this morning that you're going to follow Jesus. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. If that is the case, then uh, we can approach God's Word with the right heart. Because sometimes the Word of God gives us what we want to hear, and sometimes it gets us, gives us what we don't want to hear. The question is not whether or not we want to hear it, but whether or not we're willing to follow it, whether it's what we want to hear or not. And uh, this, I think, is a good example of this. John chapter 10, and we'll uh, examine a few verses here, but I want to start with verse 10. that says this, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I uh, have seen many, many uses of this phrase, abundant life, that Jesus promises us Abundant life as Christians. This is something I lived in Tennessee for 10 years, and this is, um, I, I saw so many ministries called Abundant Life Ministries, and, and even businesses called Abundant Life Photography, Abundant Life uh, Wedding Services, Abundant Life This, Abundant Life uh, Financial Services, you know. Whatever, everything has, has that phrase, Abundant Life, it seems like, uh, down, uh, down in Tennessee where I was. And uh, some good friends of mine actually started a business called it Abundant Life. And I, I started to question what that, word, that phrase really means because it's usually used to refer to abundance of something in life. Right? It's usually meant, um, it, it, when, when people use it, they usually mean to say that Jesus promises abundant happiness in life. He promises abundant wealth in life. He promises abundant peace in life, abundant something in life. But what this phrase does not say is that there's anything that's going to be abundant in the life that God gives, but rather that the life itself is abundant. Abundance here is, of course, a word that just means more of, a lot of something. If I had an abundant number of children, I would have a lot of them. I have four, so that's kind of abundant, right? If I have abundant life, I should have a lot of life. Not, not a certain quality of life is not what Jesus is saying here. That's not to say that a Christian has a poor or a good quality of life. That's just not the point he's making. He's saying here that he came to give life, and not just life, but eternal life. Life that has no ending. Abundant life. More than just life. Just unending eternal life that has no end. This is really the emphasis. And when we expand and we see the context of what Jesus is saying here, he's making a point to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were having this same problem as they understood, um, not Christianity, but they understood the worship of God. It was all for the benefit and of themselves and to make their lives better. To make their riches more abundant, to make their success more abundant, you know, their own personal goals being achieved. This, this was the attitude that the Pharisees had, and Jesus was actually speaking against it. And we'll see this as we examine the passage. But here's the question, what does it mean to have life that is abundant, and what is the point that Jesus is getting at? To, to explain this, we must go back to John chapter 9. So if you'll follow with me, we'll read John chapter 9 and understand what was taking place here. Jesus, in the book of John, John is expressing the deity of Christ. He is, he is writing and choosing stories from the ministry of Christ that are specifically underlining and underscoring that Jesus is God, that he is one with the Father, that they are one. And so he uh, has so far given us all the, from chapters 1 through chapter 8, many interactions, specifically with the Pharisees, where he's condemning them for not believing in God at all because they didn't receive him. And the point that Jesus has been making throughout the book is that you cannot be a believer in God and not a believer in Jesus because the God you believe in isn't the true God because Jesus 
is the true God, right? This is the point that Jesus has been making throughout the book. And in verse number one, of course, this is very offensive to the Pharisees who, who are the religious leaders of Israel who are supposedly worshiping the true God, but in all of their religious pursuits to worship the God of Israel, they were not truly worshiping the true God of Israel because here was the God of Israel in front of them in human flesh and they rejected him. So Jesus was pointing out their own hypocrisy. Now in verse uh, chapter one of, of uh, verse one of chapter nine, we see this other example of these of this same conversation that Jesus has with the Pharisees. It starts this way, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, "Master, who did sin that this man or his, uh, this man or his parents that he was born blind?" The idea that the disciples had uh, was a very common idea back in those days. They sort of thought about, well, why does this person have this disease? God is in charge of all things. And if maybe if, if he had been living his life and then he got diseased, maybe there'd be a question. Did a demon uh, put a disease on him? Did a demon sort of assault him? Um, or was it something that God brought in judgment on him? But since he was born blind... They, they could tell that this is not a disease that comes from some sort of demonic attack or from Satan. It's clearly something that God allowed in his life. So the question then becomes, why did God allow this man to be born blind? Why did God put this disease on him? God creates a man in, in his mother's womb, and God created this man blind. And so the question then is, well, surely the reason has to be because of sin, and uh, then, so the sin has to be either in the parents, the parents sinned, or maybe he sinned while he was still in his mother's womb and, and God put blindness on him, or God knew that he was going to sin, or something like that. So they're asking Jesus this deep question. And uh, Jesus answers, verse 3, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Notice that, that all sickness is not the result of sin. Sometimes God allows sickness and difficulties to come into a life just to accomplish God's purpose, and you don't need to know what the purpose is. You know, we're going to find out what the purpose is for this blind man uh, because Jesus is going to heal him and is going to bring glory to God. But the point that Jesus is making here is that you don't have to know, you know, you don't have to boil it down and figure this out. All you know is that if I've allowed something to happen, it's going to accomplish my purpose, period, right? It's not always a result of sin. Now he continues, verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus now makes a statement about himself. Um, I'm sorry, verse 4, I, I skipped. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, the disciples must have been scratching their head. They were asking about this man who was born blind, and Jesus is seemingly changing the conversation, saying there's a purpose for him to be born blind, and then talking about his own purpose. Well, those were connected because Jesus' purpose in that moment was to heal the man, to bring glory to himself and to the Father, to show that he was doing the works of the Father, because only the Father could heal someone who was born blind, right? Right? If, if, they were, if they were blinded by the devil, if the devil had done some demonic assault on them and had blinded their eyes, then the devil could stop his assault and they would be able to see again. But since he was born blind, meaning that God made him that way, a devil can't undo what God has done is the thought process that they had. And so Jesus was about to demonstrate that he was doing things that only God can do. And so he's about to make the man see. So it says this, verse 6, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. The neighbors therefore, and they which therefore had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is, it not, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore they said unto him, how were thine eyes opened? Now there was no question about the fact that he was now able to see. This was a man who was born blind. He could not fake being able to see. 
And, uh, and it's not like that, you know, last week he just says, oh, I'm blind, and, and walks around pretending to be blind for a week, and now, oh, I can see. It was not one of these Benny Hinn slaps somebody on the forehead, and you never know where they came from and if they ever really were sick, you know? This was somebody who was born blind. Everybody knew that he had been blind all of his life, and now he's walking around, and it's very obvious that he can see. So, um, so how did this happen, they ask. And... Uh, uh, verse, uh, verse 10, they said, Therefore unto him, how were thine eyes opened? Verse 11, he answered, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received my sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought him to the Pharisees <clears throat> that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now, this is important to note because remember the Old Testament says that the that you are not to do servile labor. You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath day. That was the Jewish the law for the Jewish nation. Now, the Pharisees had taken this and had gone above and beyond with their desire to serve God in this area, and not only uh, they they had tried to define exactly what was labor. Uh, under the under this command not to do labor on the Sabbath day and um, they had gone so far as anyone who carries any kind of a burden if you picked up a blanket uh, and carried it you would be considered guilty of breaking the law of not doing any labor on the Sabbath day and so they they went very very much above and beyond the command of God was just simply not to to labor not to the point was that masters were not support, su supposed to force their servants to work every day of the week. They had to let them have a day off. That was the point of the Sabbath day. And now the Pharisees had taken it far beyond what it was meant to be and added much to it. And now they're going to be upset that Jesus is not following their additions to the commandments of God. Because Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath day, which didn't take any labor, but, you know, he, he made clay uh, out of the dirt. So that's, you know, that's breaking the law. That's labor. And so here's what it says. Um, verse uh, <clears throat> uh, verse uh, 15. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. <clears throat> he said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed and I do see and do see. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Uh, meaning, uh, this man can't be of God because he's not following the additions we've made to the Sabbath day. He's not following our instructions. Um, so he can't be of God because he's not obeying us. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? If he's not of God, how is he healing someone who God clearly made blind? He was born blind. Uh, others said, how, how can this man who, that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. They say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him that hath opened thine eyes? He said he is a prophet. Now, this is the least that the man could say. He doesn't know Jesus. He's never actually even seen him before because he was blind when Jesus met him, and he hasn't seen him since. And so the least he can say is, listen, I know he's a prophet. Well, how do you know he's a prophet? Well, because he, told, he put clay on my eyes and told me to go wash, and he knew what was going to happen. So he predicted what was going to happen that I was going to see, whether he healed me or not, I can't tell you that, but I know at least that he's a prophet, right? He told me to go wash, and now I see. So he knew what was going to happen. He's a prophet. He's at least a prophet. Verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. So they said, well, surely this guy's lying. He's not, he was not truly blind and then received his sight. So they called the parents of him that had received his sight, and they asked him, saying, is, your, is this your son? who ye say was born blind, how then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. By what means he now seeth, we know not, or what, uh, what, what hath, who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. Now his parents don't know how he was, he was healed. Of course, he's probably told his parents, but his parents are just saying, Listen, all we know is that he was blind. We can confirm when he was born, he was blind. And now he can see the rest you're going to have to figure out on your own. Now, they're not wanting to get into this for a good reason. Look what it says this <clears throat> in the next verse, verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, 
meaning the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, that Jesus was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Now, the synagogue was very important. It was the communal place for the Jews. In, in every city all over the Roman Empire, there were synagogues where Jewish people could come together. They would help each other out. A Jew was never on his own. No matter what city he went to, there was always a synagogue where they would get together and they would be, they would be like a family. And to be kicked out of the synagogue was a very serious problem for, for the Jewish people. So the threat was, if you confess that Jesus is the Christ, you're out of the synagogue. And so they're very, being very careful not to say anything about Jesus. They just want to say, listen, he was blind when he was born, and now he sees the rest. Uh, we, we, it's not our business. Okay, verse 23, therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Verse 24, and then again called they the man, the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise, we know this man is a sinner. Uh, what they're asking here is, they're saying, clearly you were born blind and you're now healed. Praise God for that. God heals you. Don't praise this man, meaning Jesus. He's a wicked, sinful man who's not following our instruction, <laughs> not following us. You should praise God, not this man. Of course, this man, Jesus, is God, so uh, to praise God would be to praise him. Verse 25, he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that where I, whereas I was blind, now I see. Then they said it to him again, what did he to thee? How, how opened he thine eyes? He answered, them, he answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? And so he's getting a little frustrated with them. He says, listen, I was blind, now I see. The guy put clay on my eyes, I went and washed, and I can see. The guy obviously is a prophet, at least. And wh wh why is this such a problem for you? Are you guys asking me this because you want to follow him yourself? <laughs> of course not, because they have every reason to follow Jesus. He's the Messiah. Now remember, these are the Pharisees. They are the religious leaders of the people of Israel. Their job is to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Here's the Messiah, and they say he's going to take away our authority and our power. He's not following our instructions. We don't get to control the Messiah. Wait a minute. We don't like this. And so they're not interested in following the Messiah because the Messiah is not going to follow them. Because who's really in charge in their minds? It's not the Messiah or God. It's really them, isn't it? And so he's pointing, even the blind man is point, pointing this out. You guys aren't interested in, in figuring out the truth here. You're trying to find a reason to, to reject this man, Jesus. In verse 28, Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. <laughs> Now remember Moses, he got the law delivered to him by angels after God appeared on the mountain and spoke the Ten Commandments to all of Israel. Moses went up into the mountain and the, the tablets the, with the Ten Commandments were delivered to him by angels there in the mountain. So God even refused to speak directly face to face with Moses, although that he did have conversations back and forth with Moses. He would not speak face to face with Moses. There's a reason for that, because it was not to be the perfect um, communication of God with man. There was something missing. There was supposed to be something missing in the time of Moses, because the Messiah was going to come, God in human flesh, who would be God communing with man, filling that gap and, and bridging the divide between God and man. This is what Jesus came to do. So they say, we're, we're servants of Moses Instead of the, you, who are the blind man, who's, a serv who's serving this sinful man, but in reality, what they're saying is you're just serving God and we're serving a man, Moses. You see how their allegiance was to Moses, the guy, where this, and they were criticizing the blind man for having allegiance to Jesus, the Messiah. And, and so it, it's very backwards what they're saying, but they think that this gives them credibility that they're standing on the law of Moses, which says you don't work on the Sabbath, and they've been able to add to the law of Moses because, you know, they're the servants of Moses. They can do that. Verse 29, We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. 
Well, look, all the people were standing around the base of the mountain when Moses walked up into the mountain, and we knew God was there with him, and uh, so we know that God spoke to Moses. We don't know if God spoke to, to this guy, Jesus. And so the blind man responds, uh, the man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Don't you have evidence that he is from God? What do you mean you don't know where he came from? Who can heal someone who God has made blind other than God, right? I mean, God clearly made me blind from birth, and now I'm healed. This man did it. How can you say that he's not from God? Verse 31, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man believeth, a, uh, any, any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he, him he heareth. Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. The funny thing is, if they're, they're claiming that because he was born blind, he was born in sin, like his parents were sinful, and that's the reason that he was born blind. But remember that if that's the reason that he was born blind, then him being healed means not only that the healer had the ability to heal what God had, had caused, but also that the healer had the ability to forgive sins. So they're actually admitting, they're, they're sort of contradicting their own argument, aren't they? They're actually contradicting themselves in this argument. So verse 34, the, all of this is just to explain to you the attitude of the Pharisees that Jesus is responding to in chapter 10. So watch as we finish up this chapter. It says, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. <clears throat> oh, verse 34, we should finish that. Uh, that was altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out, meaning they cast him out of the synagogue. He's not allowed to be in the synagogue anymore. Although, I suppose you get your sight back, that's a better deal <laughs> than still being able to stay in the synagogue. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, this is an important question. This is a messianic question because Psalm chapter 2 says that the Messiah would be called the Son of God. Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee, it says in Psalm chapter 2. So when he says, do you believe on the Son of God? He's saying, do you believe on the Messiah, the Son of God, who is here? And uh, uh, the, the man who was, had been blind, uh, verse 36, he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? So he says, listen, I trust you. You're the one who put clay on my eyes and prophesied that I would be healed if I went. So I know you're from God. Now just, I'm, I'm listening. You tell me who's the Messiah. And he said, yeah, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. I love how, how he answered that. You have seen him, which limits the number of people now because this man's only been able to see for a few days. So there's not a whole lot of options here when he says, you've seen him, and uh, you've seen him with your own eyes, and it's me. It's him who's talking with thee. Um, it says, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into the world that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. So here he's calling the Pharisees blind, and we'll talk about that in the next two verses. And some of the Pharisees which were with him. So, of course, Jesus is pretty much always surrounded by crowds of people. And there are Pharisees in the crowd when Jesus says this to the man. Some of the Pharisees which were with him uh, heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Are you saying, Lord, I'm, I'm offended by that, <laughs> Jesus. Because you're, I feel like you're saying that I'm blind. You want to take that back? You want to apologize? You want to... Uh, uh, ha, you, know, you want to come out and stand in solidarity with the Pharisees here, Lord? And uh, Jesus says, uh, verse 41, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. So when he's saying, I want people who are blind to see and people who see to be blind, he's explaining that in verse 41. Listen, the point is, if you say that you see, then you'll never see that you're blind. But if you will just admit and understand and come to the realization that you're blind, then I could heal you and you'd be able to see. You see that? Like, here's the Pharisees who were so convinced that they were right, 
that they were literally rejecting the Messiah. They, they just were not open to the idea that they could be wrong, right? Because, you know, they're the Pharisees. They're the ones in charge. How dare anyone, even the Messiah, challenge their authority? And Jesus said, I wish you were blind. I wish you could see how blind you were. And now, notice he was not asking people to just accept him as the Messiah for no reason. Right? But the blind man had no preconceptions. He just said, well, this guy healed me. And he prophesied what was going to happen. And clearly, he's from God. And then he said that he's the Messiah. I believe him. He's not lying. He's from God. He just healed me. Right? He's putting two and two together. He's following the evidence. The Pharisees, on the other hand, are presented with evidence. They see all the weight of the evidence that says Jesus is the Messiah. And they say, no, because that doesn't fit with what I want to believe. You see. So Jesus is calling them blind. But he goes on. Verse 1 of chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Who's he talking about here? Pharisees. He's saying, not, not only are you blind, or you, you're, you're blind, but you don't see it, that you're blind, but you're thieves and robbers. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. <clears throat> Jesus is painting a picture here. He says, in the sheepfold, the sheep being the people of God, you guys are thieves and robbers. Yeah, you're inside of the fold, but you're not part of the sheep. You, you, and here's how you know that you're not part of the sheep, because you climbed up over the wall to get in. Okay, so what, what do you mean, Jesus? Well, he's going to explain in a moment. Uh, verse uh, verse three to him the uh, but he that en- verse two he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So if you want to be you think you guys are shepherding the sheep of God, being the leaders of of Israel, um, then you should have come in through the door. To him the porter that means the person who's keeping the entrance of the fold opens allows him in and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable Jesus spake unto them, I spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So now he's starting to explain his, this parable. He's saying, I am the door. You think that you're part of the people of God, but you're rejecting the Messiah, who is the door to enter in to the sheepfold. Which means you're climbing in to, be, to say you're part of God's people, but you're not accepting the Messiah, which means you're not part of God's people. It doesn't matter if you're by blood an Israelite. You are not part of the people of God if you refuse to accept the Messiah. If you refuse to accept Jesus, you must come through the door or you're not really in there for the right reasons and therefore are not sheep, right? Anyone who comes into a sheepfold, that would be, a sheepfold was not usually very high walls. Um, Typically back then, sheepfold would just be rather low walls that would sort of circle an area where they could put the sheep in and let them lay down for the night. And usually there was just one entrance. It wasn't usually more than several feet tall. It wasn't, you know, we're not talking about a giant wall. Um, and it would be rather easy for someone, for a person to climb over the wall. But the idea was it would keep the sheep from running away and keep the animals from, from, from just jumping in, you know, wolves and, and such. And at the, at the door, there would be an entrance to the sheepfold. Usually there wouldn't be an actual swinging door. There would just be an entrance. And typically that is where the shepherd would sleep for the night. The shepherd would usually sleep in the entranceway and he would be the door. He would be, he would have to allow people to go in or out. And anyone who got in there that the shepherd didn't let in was not supposed to be there. (laughs) They were there for nefarious reasons. Uh, You probably can uh, relate uh, to it by just imagining your own home. You know, if someone comes and knocks on the door and you open the door and ask them to come in for a meal, then uh, they're there for good reasons because you let them in. 
But then if you get to the meal and you sit down and there's a couple people there that you did not invite in and uh, who snuck in the side door and aren't supposed to be there, you know that those are not part of your guests. <laughs> they, are, they might be part of the group here, but they're not, they're not supposed to be. And Jesus is saying, look, you are part of this group that is called the people of God, but you are not sheep. You're not part of the people of God because you don't want Jesus. He says, you're thieves and robbers, meaning you came for these wrong reasons. You came for what you can get from the sheep. Power and authority and wealth is what the Pharisees were getting from God's people. And when the Messiah comes, it's revealed that they're not in it for the Messiah. They're not in it for truly worshiping God. They're in it for themselves and what they can get from it. It's funny that this is often how most people use the phrase abundant life, isn't it? What God gives me, how God makes me successful, how God gives me more abundant wealth or me more abundant happiness in my life, which is the exact thing Jesus is scolding the Pharisees for. You're thieves and robbers. You want to be called part of the people of God, but you don't want to give honor and glory to the one who is the door the only way into the sheep. You're not there by permission. You're there to be thieves and robbers and to steal the glory of God, to steal the authority of God, to rob that from the the Messiah. And this is a problem because all they cared about was themselves. He's going to give another analogy, but let's continue this one. Verse 7, he says, "Uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me, or meaning outside of coming through me, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep don't hear them. They, they did not hear them. Verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. You see, if you enter in through the door, you're part of the sheep, right? You're going to enter. You're going to find pasture. You're going to follow Christ. But the others who are coming in aren't even sheep, right? They're, they're, they're thieves and robbers. They're the images. They're even people. Like, it's obvious that they're not sheep. It's very clear and, and evident. It says, verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He's saying, you Pharisees are pretending to be part of the people of God, but you reject me as the Messiah, and so you're just here to steal the glory of God, to steal the power and the authority of God, to kill and to destroy the people of God. I am come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He says, here's here's the reason I'm here to give my sheep everlasting life, abundant life. That's what Jesus came for. Remember, Jesus is going to lay down his life, not seeking his own benefit in, in, in life, but he's going to lay down his life so that the sheep, that we can have eternal life. But the Pharisees are here pretending to be the real leaders who are better than, than Jesus, And all they're in it for is for themselves and what they can get from it rather than actually caring about the sheep. Case in point, a blind man who was blind since he was born is miraculously healed and they're in an outrage. How dare he be healed on the Sabbath? Because that's against our added rules and regulations. Instead of saying, that's awesome. God just healed a man who was born blind. We're so happy for you. This is wonderful because we care about God's people. No, they don't care about God's people. They're just more interested in what this does to their authority and their power and their goals. Notice that he goes on in verse, uh, verse 11. He says, not only is he the sheep, is he the door. In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. So he's not only the door, but also the shepherd, which is very normal for a sheepfold, that the door would be the shepherd. He would lay in the door. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. This was a common problem in, in the first century. People who owned sheep, if they had a lot of them, they would hire people to come on, and, and help care for the sheep. The problem is that being a shepherd was a thankless job. You did, I mean, this was not something you went into because you, you want to climb the ladder of success. 
okay? This was not a, uh, you know, this is not the career choice. You go home and tell your parents, hey, I got the job of my dreams. I'm a shepherd, you know? It's like saying, it's like, it's like, you know, flipping burgers at Wendy's, you know? It's like, hey, I got the, I've got the best job in the world. I'm, I'm going to be working fast food. No, it's sort of like, I don't have anything else. I'm going to do this, right? Um, and so these people were notorious for not being very reliable, right? You know, they, they weren't about to give their lives for sheep, right? I'm not, I don't even want this job. I'm doing it because I have to have it for the money, right? And this is what they would call a hireling. Someone who, when push came to shove, is out of there when the wolf comes because they're not really, they were just here to get some money. Now, but now, if, you, if they actually owned the sheep, if it was the owner of the sheep, if, was, if he was shepherding his own sheep, it worked out much better because he actually had an interest in caring for the sheep. He didn't, it wasn't going to help him to run. He was going to give his life for the sheep. And Jesus is saying, so not only are the Pharisees blind and they don't see it, they're thieves and robbers, but they're also hirelings. They're pretending to lead the people of God, but they're running as soon as a problem comes. They're not interested in helping the people of God at all. Case in point, the blind man who is blind from birth and healed. And he says, all you care about is what you can get from it. And then he says, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 13, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Jesus is making it very clear here that those who come to him, those who call themselves Christians, who do so because of some advantage they get for being Christian, whether it just be a social thing, you know, others, everyone else calls himself a Christian, so I'm just going to say I'm a Christian because I live in a Christian nation and I have Christian friends. Or whether it's because, you know, hey, if I call myself a Christian and call this church, maybe they'll give me a little help when things go bad or, you know, whatever it is that is your motive for being a part of the people of God that is not through the door, that is not following Christ, there, there's a problem there. And, and I think that there's, there's two, two things we need to ask ourselves as a result of this passage. Number one, are we truly sheep? I mean, everyone in this room, I would imagine, is going to call themselves a Christian, right? I mean, look, we're all here. We're, we would be all, st- in this picture, we'd all be standing in the fold, right? But the question is, how did you get there? You see, when the Bible talks about salvation, it says that it's not just a matter of believing that Jesus did die on the cross and rise from the dead. It's a matter of believing it in such a way that it causes us to repent. Now, what does repent mean? Well, repent means that Jesus died for my sins, so I'm not going to live for myself in sin anymore. I'm going to live for him. That's why Romans chapter 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord, meaning the Messiah, the rabbi, the, the master, if you'll confess that he's in charge, that he's the master, that means turning from I'm in charge of me and repenting. That means turning to something new and saying he's the master. Um, now, someone says, well, what you're saying is that every time that I mess up and don't act like Jesus is the master, then I'm out of the fold. No, that's not how it works, see. When you come to Christ, you come to Christ by faith and repentance, and you say, I, I'm done with me, I'm for him. And then you find out that you often still live for yourself. You often still make mistakes, right? That doesn't mean that you always are successful at that choice, but you've come by faith in Jesus Christ, repenting and turning to him as the master. You've said, I want to live for him. That's an important uh, part of salvation that most people forget. Most people think, well, I prayed a prayer. I said, I said this, or I said that, or yeah, I just believe And so I'm a Christian. No, you're a thief and a robber. You you like the idea of being a Christian, but you don't want to actually repent and turn to Christ as your master. And that is what it means to be a Christian. Now, again, this this is something that I can't analyze in your own life. This is something you must analyze in in your own heart. 
Am I truly a Christian? Did I, is there a moment in, in time when not, I, I didn't just say, I believe in Jesus, but I, I decided because of my faith in Christ that I was going to live for him, that he was going to be the master. And I turned to him as my Lord and a Savior. Not just because I want, want my life to be better. And this is what I'm concerned of. I think that saying that Jesus gives us abundant life without explaining what that means often causes a lot of people to want to come to Christ in faith because they're going to get wealth and health and, and abundance of things in life rather than coming to Christ in submission, in repentance, and saying, I want you, the good shepherd. I want you, the door. I want you because you've laid down your life for me. And in that, they get all the other things, right? One day we're in heaven, we have wealth, we have health, we have all those other things. Yes, but that's not, like, that's not the goal, is it? The goal is I'm repenting and turning to Christ because of Christ, because of Jesus. So there's the first question, and that is, are you truly part of the sheep? Not just inside the fold, but did you get there through the door? Did you get there by turning to Christ in repentance? And secondly, if the answer is yes to number one, are you living for Christ now? That doesn't mean that you're out of the sheep. Now, Jesus is going to go on. We're going to talk about the rest of this chapter uh, probably next week. Jesus is going to go on about how once you're part of the sheep, you can't get out, right? He says, uh, you're in my hand and you're in the Father's hand and no one can pluck you from the Father's hand and all this stuff. Once you've made the choice by faith in the gospel that you're going to turn from yourself as the master and turn to him as the master, then the rest is on, you know, the rest is, is set in stone. You are a Christian, period. You cannot stop being part of the sheep. But oftentimes we still start to live again like God owes us something in this life. We start saying, well, you know, I want to be, I want to do this or I want to do that based on how it be benefits me, not how does it benefit the, the cause of Christ. And sometimes I wonder if, if we, we make some of the biggest decisions that we make in our lives without ever stopping to think of, about how this is a service to Christ. Because that's what our lives are for. Service to Christ. You know? I mean, look, you, 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 go, to, you go to work tomorrow and something's said and, and man, you want to get angry about it. And maybe you have a good right to be angry about it. But did you ever stop and think, how would me being angry about this service Christ? How would, be that, how would that serve Jesus with my life? Well, maybe, maybe I should rethink how I act in this situation since that's what my life is for, serving him. You know, people, people get upset. Well, how, how can you say this is sin or that is sin or whatever? Well, hang on. Is your life for you or is your life for Christ? I think a lot of the question about whether or not it's sin or not, this, this thing or that thing, um, always boils down to people just wanting to, get, wanting to do things that makes them happy rather than really wanting to do things that makes God happy. You know, what is your life for? Is it for service of yourself or for, is it for service of God? I think when we read verse 10 as Jesus promising abundant things in our life, we think, yeah, Jesus saved us to give us everything I want. Instead of saying, no, Jesus saved us to give us everlasting life. And now we, because of that, should live and give and serve and, and sweat and toil and labor and, and even suffer, if that's what he has for us, for him. Out of love for him, because he's the good shepherd who has given his life for the sheep. Father in heaven, I am so grateful to you as the door of the sheep. Lord, I thank you for the abundant, everlasting life that you've given me, that you've given us freely. I thank you for sacrificing your own life that we might have life. But I pray, Lord, that you'd forgive me for often living for myself, becoming a Pharisee in my actions because so much of my life becomes about how I can advance my own agenda, my own purpose, 
rather than stopping to think how it advances your purpose and your call and your goals. Forgive me for these things. Help me to live for you, I pray in Jesus' name.